Okay, hello everyone. Uh, I'm seeing our participants list kind of leveling off here. So we're gonna go ahead and and uh, get underway. Um, good to have you all here today. Uh, my name is Todd Stocky. I am the Senior Vice President and Editorial Director at Sourcebooks. Um, I've had the privilege of working on behalf of our authors at Sourcebooks for more than 27 years. And I've seen the publisher grow from a tiny small press to one regularly creating national bestsellers. And I'll be popping in today to introduce our fabulous authors today. But first, I'm going to introduce Sourcebooks publisher and CEO, Dominique Rocca. Dominique founded Sourcebooks from her home in 1987. And from those scrappy kitchen table roots, Dominique has led Sourcebooks to its position as the largest woman-owned book publisher in the country. She now leads a small army of book-loving Sourcebookers who are guided by our mission that books change lives. Dominique is an entrepreneur's entrepreneur. She's been widely recognized as a leader in innovation in book publishing and has won every innovation award that the industry gives and was named Publishers Weekly Person of the Year in 2016. But most importantly, Dominique is an expansive reader. I can tell you from experience that there aren't many types of books that Dominique hasn't devoured. And I think the wide variety of authors we publish and the authors who are here today reflect Dominique's adventurous book loving spirit. Dominique, the floor is yours. Thanks, Todd, and thank you for that introduction. And I welcome you all to, uh, to hear on um, these extraordinary authors. And before we start, I, I really wanna thank each and every one of you, both for joining us, but also for the work that you do every day. We are really in an unprecedented time. The world around us has fundamentally changed. And in this moment, books, reading, and each of you and the work that you do are helping us to navigate these new waters. We've also seen so many of our friends and colleagues on the bookseller and librarian end come up with completely new ways to get books into the hands of readers. I mean, I've seen pictures in shelf awareness of booksellers delivering books on horseback. We do what we have to do to create the book community of tomorrow. It's such an exciting and yes, challenging time, both of those things. People are reading more, people are finding books on all sorts of places. People are discovering books on TikTok. How cool is that? That really speaks to the resilience of books in our community in these times. Thank you to all of the reviewers and editors and influencers who continue to beat the drum on behalf of books. Obviously, we have to mention the book banning that we're experiencing as a community today. There are so many people trying to silence voices here in America and abroad, which is something that we obviously have to take a stand against. We need to continue to create important connections for readers and the people who don't even know that they're readers yet. You know, at Sourcebooks, we talk about the fact that books change lives and it's our, book, our job as book lovers to put the right book into the hands of the people who need them. It's our job to create a sense of community so that everyone has a safe space to be themselves and to learn about themselves. It doesn't matter what you read, whether you read you know, spicy feminist romances or cookbooks that feed your stomach and your soul, thrillers that have layered characters, fascinating true crime or women's fiction that centers around discovering your place in the world. The authors you're going to see today represent all of that and are committing, committed to creating the connections that readers need. And I can't begin to tell you how proud I am to be their publisher and to think of everyone. I think of everyone really who, who joins Sourcebooks as, as being part of this book community that we have here. You know, many of you know that I started this bedroom, this business in my bedroom in Naperville 34 years ago. Um, many of you on this call have grown up with me in this industry. Thank you for being with me then. And thank you for being with me and my family this afternoon. Today, Sourcebooks is very different, different in ways that I couldn't even have imagined then. And many of you and all of the members of our extraordinary team have helped to shape and develop the publisher we are today. Today, we are the largest woman-owned book publisher in the country. You all created that with me. And last year, we were the fastest growing book publisher in America among the top publishers. By the way, we've done that incredible double digit growth for six out of the last seven years. And again, you all created that with me and with us. Thank you. 
I look forward to continuing our work together as we create the book community of tomorrow. Todd, will you introduce our first author? Thank you all. Here we go. So thank you, uh, thank you Dominique. Um, uh, before jumping into our author presentations, I want to make sure to mention that most of the books presented today will be available to request on Edelweiss and NetGalley. Um, and I'll remind you all of that again at the end, but uh, Edelweiss and NetGalley. So I am honored to introduce our first author today, Casey Sherman, who's written an incredibly compelling work of true crime with a literary twist. Casey Sherman is a renowned investigative journalist and the New York Times USA Today and Wall Street Journal bestselling author of 15 books, including The Finest Hours, now a major motion picture starring Chris Pine. Patriot's Day, now a major motion picture starring Mark Wahlberg, and James Patterson's The Last Days of John Lennon. Casey was inducted into the National Crime Museum in 2014 for his groundbreaking work on the Boston Marathon bombings. He has appeared on more than 100 television programs and is the host of the popular true crime podcast Saints, Sinners, and Serial Killers. Casey, tell us about your work. Well, thank you, Todd. Thank you, Dominique. And uh, thank you all for uh, participating in this really exciting webinar today. You know, gang, I call myself the accidental author. I never believed that I'd be writing books one day, but that is until I was... The biggest cases in American crime, the case of the Boston Strangler. You see, my aunt, 19-year-old Mary Sullivan, was the youngest and final victim of this notorious 1960s murder spree. I reinvestigated the murder case and found that there was not just one Boston Strangler, but several men committing these heinous murders under the guise of this Jack the Ripper style character resurrected to hunt the women of Boston. My work changed the entire history of the case and it's still being written about and discussed by crime experts all over the world. It also became the subject of my first book, a surprise bestseller in 2003. I thought that I had witnessed the true heart of darkness. As an investigative journalist, I've covered over a hundred homicides, including my aunts, but nothing could prepare me for my new crime thriller, Helltown. Helltown is a story that I've been running away from for years. I grew up on Cape Cod, just down a road a piece of, from Provincetown, where in 1969, a young, charismatic, hippie killer named Tony Costa lured several young women into a beautiful but desolate area, murdered them, dismembered them, and buried them in shallow graves. The killer would eventually blame the acts on a dual personality. Now, the clinical term is called ego splitting. As a killer, he was also skilled with the knife thanks to hundreds of hours that he had spent studying taxidermy. He also had a Hitchcockian obsession with his own mother, which may have led him to murder. In Helltown, we see the murders and the case unfold not only through the killer's eyes and through the investigators that hunted the hunter, but through the eyes of two literary giants at different stages of their writing lives. Kurt Vonnegut is living on Cape Cod and terrified that his teenage daughter Evie is running around with the killer Tony Costa and his female disciples, all of whom worship him with the same passion that young women worshiped Charles Manson. In early 1969, Vonnegut is struggling. He's a, commercially, he's a commercial writing failure grappling with post-traumatic stress disorder from his experiences as a prisoner of war during World War II, as well as a budding novel called Slaughterhouse Five, which will be published a few months later, changing the course of Vonnegut's life and career. Kurt Vonnegut becomes obsessed with the Costa case and the darkness that it represents. He turns from novelist to crime reporter for Life Magazine as he tries to get to the truth behind this bizarre murder case. Now the other literary giant, Norman Mailer, he is at the opposite of Kurt Vonnegut in 1969. He's a millionaire author who's been writing best-selling books since he was 25 years old and published his literary debut, The Naked and the Dead, back in 1948. 
Naylor lives along the ocean in Provincetown, the site of a former pirate settlement called Helltown, which is the name of the book. Naylor calls writing the spooky art. He's also been running the razor's edge and exploring darkness and violence in his own life. One where he stabbed and nearly killed his second wife with a penknife and got away with it just a few years before. Mailer sees something of himself in Tony Costa, and he feels compelled to write Costa's story in his own way, fictionalizing it in his future bestseller and his future feature film, a novel called Tough Guys Don't Dance. Now, will Tony Costa also escape justice in Helltown? Unlike other killers who purposely lurk and remain in the shadows, Tony Costa is not opaque. Costa is all charm and brashness. He openly taunts the investigators in an elaborate game of cat and mouse, but police are determined to stop him from killing again. Helltown is a story about serial murder, but it's also a crime thriller about a very unique moment in American history. The themes of peace and love, which had come to represent the 60s, they're over now. In 1969, our characters are also witness to and even involved in the Chappaquiddick tra tragedy caused by US Senator Ted Kennedy, the Manson murders, and even the moon landing. Now my research for Helltown was daunting. I conducted firsthand interviews with many involved in the case. I poured over 3,000 documents like these, including crime scene reports, photos, witness interviews, and trial transcripts. I also gained access to 12 hours of rare audio taped interviews with the killer and his unpublished manuscript where he recounts the crimes in full detail for the very first time. The murders portrayed in Helltown are all too real, as are the motives behind the mayhem. Helltown explores toxic masculinity and our increasing fascination with true crime. Comparative titles include Casey Sepp's The Furious Hours, Truman Capote's In Cold Blood, and even Emma Klein's The Girls. I was also inspired by my recent work with James Patterson on our true crime novel, The Last Days of John Lennon, which recently sp spent 13 weeks on the New York Times bestsellers list. Now, I've been blessed to have success in Hollywood with my books turned into films like Patriot's Day and The Finest Hours that were mentioned, as well as my appearances on more than 100 television programs, including The View, if you can believe that. Uh, I'm currently working with Robert Downey Jr. and his production company, Team Downey, to adapt this book into a limited series for television where Downey will most likely play Kurt Vonnegut himself. Now, I applaud all of you independent booksellers who continue to bring new stories to light. In my travel, the first stop is always to the local bookstore where I introduce myself to the staff and thank them for all their hard work. I believe your local bookstore kind of serves as the central nervous system for the community where both conversations and inspirations are born. I'm Casey Sherman. My latest thriller, once again, is called Helltown, and I thank you all for your time. Thank you, Casey. Uh, not uh, not too often we hear from from writers whose work is being developed by Iron Man, so that's <laughs> pretty cool. Thank you. Um, I'm going to uh, uh, change uh, uh, change gears a little bit here, and we're going to go uh, and introduce Scarlett St. Clair. Scarlett St. Clair is the best-selling author of the Hades and Persephone saga, the Hades saga, King of Battle and Blood, and When Stars Come Out. She has a master's degree in library science and information studies, hey, librarians out there, and a bachelor's in English writing, and she is obsessed with Greek mythology, murder mysteries, and the afterlife. Scarlett, can you come tell us about your new, uh, your upcoming book, A Game of Retribution? I would be glad to. It's nice to follow that and then not because you spoke so great. So, <laughs> um, but yeah, I am Scarlett Sinclair. I'm so happy to be here. I was almost not here because 
I spent the last week in Chicago furiously writing the book that I'm about to talk about. Um, <laughs> and it was actually due today, but things happen. And um, I have about 20K left to write. And by Friday, I will have written 50K in two weeks, which I don't recommend. Uh, but I do this all the time because I am chaos. So <laughs> don't do it like me. Um, but yeah, I was a librarian. Um, I do have a master's degree in library science and information studies. I was a librarian for five years. I actually managed the teen and adult services department at the Southwest Oklahoma City Public Library. And this kind of takes me back to when I last presented at PLA. Um, we had to do virtual presentations and in-person presentations. I was most nervous about the virtual ones because I couldn't see who I was talking to at all. And uh, I did better on that one than I did on the in-person one. So <laughs> cheers to this one, I, it'll be great. Um, but yeah, I really think being a librarian prepared me to be a better author, especially because we go through that process of understanding people's information seeking behavior. And we also get to see firsthand how readers search for books and they're usually reading what their friends are reading. And so in my career, I just started out as a self-publisher. I think that helped me market to my audience better. Uh, and that kind of led to the explosion on TikTok, right? So <laughs> TikTok, uh, the world of TikTok took me by storm and sort of pushed me into this whole new level of success where my books, uh, especially A Touch of Darkness, were uh, was involved and it has been <laughs> mind blowing and thrill and amazing and it's actually how I ended up here at uh, source books, which is my home and I love it and I am I'm just really thankful and so I owe a lot of my success to readers and booksellers and librarians. Um, I'm very connected to my readers. I um, try to stay involved with them all the time. And that's one of the reasons why I started writing the Haiti Saga to, it's a companion series to my main series, the Haiti and Stephanie series. So confusing, I'm sorry, but uh, blame my readers. Uh, so I, I started writing it because they asked for it. They asked for a touch of darkness from Haiti's point of view. Hence, A Game of Fate was born. And I hate to sort of use that language. I hate to sort of say like, um, A Game of Fate is a touch of darkness from Haiti's point of view because it has a completely different plot. And if you've read it, you know that. So now the book I'm working on and actively writing <laughs> is A Game of Retribution. And it is Haiti's point of view of a touch of ruin. So confusing, I'm so sorry. I will, next time I will have a chart and I will point at everything so you can, <laughs> so you can follow me on this. But um, yeah, A Game of Retribution, it centers around Haiti's kind of fragile relationship with Hera. And Hera is the goddess of women. And after Hades refuses to overthrow Zeus, help her overthrow Zeus, she challenges him to 12 labors, ranging from killing mythical monsters to um, recovering deadly artifacts. And all the while, he's trying to maintain balance in his personal life, and it does not go well. And the thing I love about this is I get to pull from all sorts of different myths uh, in Greek mythology. So you can already see some. We, we're referencing Hera overthrowing Zeus and she tries to enlist the help of Poseidon and Apollo and of course he's it's thwarted and uh, Apollo and Poseidon have to spend time as mortals serving a king and <laughs> Hera gets hung up in the sky and it doesn't go well right and then we're also referencing the labors of Heracles um, which people tend to say Hercules because of the Disney movie. Um, so it's got a lot of really cool elements from actual Greek mythology that I'm so excited to share with you guys. It's what I love about Greek mythology. It's what I love about modern retelling. Um, so a game of retribution comes out May 31st and we will have a pre-order incentive. So hold on to your um, receipts because we're doing a bonus scene from Hades and Persephone, uh, Hades and Persephone. Yay. Okay, thank you, Scarlett. So um, from myths and monsters to murder and mayhem, we um, uh, are going to keep everyone in, in uh, uh, the fiction mood here with uh, uh, some crime and suspense from Joshua Moley. Joshua lives in my hometown of Minneapolis and works as a program manager for a major medical device company. And there he kept her is his first novel. And if I may add, it's a stunning debut with one of my favorite protagonists of the year. Joshua, tell us about your book. Thanks, Todd. Uh, thanks, everyone, for having me. Um, as Todd mentioned, uh, I've made my career in 
the medical device industry. I've been working in that for uh, about 20 years now. But my dream since I was a kid was to be an author, uh, a novelist, uh, a writer, whatever you want to call it. And um, I'm so excited that it's finally coming true, thanks to the good folks at um, Sourcebooks. Uh, and there he kept her is my debut novel. Uh, it is a thriller. It is the first in a series. Um, it comes out June 14th. Um, the, the book opens, we have two teenagers, uh, it's, it's late at night, it's storming, these two kids are breaking into this old man's house looking for uh, prescription drugs. Uh, they don't know anything about this old man, they just know that he's got the, the pills that they're looking for. Uh, the old man's name is Emmett, he's in his late 60s, early 70s, uh, he's uh, isolated, he's uh, living in uh, poverty almost. Uh, he's old and dealing with chronic pain. And uh, what these kids don't know is that Emmett was responsible many years ago for the kidnapping and disappearance for several women uh, in the area. And so things, chapter one uh, ends with a bang. And uh, I was really kind of interested in exploring this idea of what happens to the monster as he gets older and uh, time and infirmities and, and things catch up with him. And he goes from being uh, the one preying on people to the one being preyed upon. Uh, so Emmett ends up with a, a, a teenage girl locked in his basement, uh, which is pretty much the last thing he wants at this point in his life. Uh, but as the story goes on, we find out that Emmett's actually not even the biggest threat to uh, what's going on here. And so when you have the, these other uh, forces, internal and external that uh, bear on the story. It really kind of changes the dynamic between uh, Emmett and um, Jenny is the girl's name. And uh, also maybe changes how even the reader uh, understands Emmett. He's, uh, definitely be a, a, he's definitely a monster, but you start to uh, ask what else is he? Um, so our hero is Ben Packard and Ben Packard was a police officer in Minneapolis. And after a tragedy in his personal life, he decides he needs a fresh start and a reset. So he moves to the small town of uh, Sandy Lake, Minnesota, takes a job as a sheriff's deputy. Um, ben Packard has a, actually has a connection to this area. His grandparents had a cabin. He spent summers here, but they also had a, a, something happened to his brother many, many years ago. Uh, and the family stopped coming back to this area. So uh, Packard is back. He's taken a new job in this small town. Um, he has a cousin who still lives in the area, and it's actually his cousin's daughter, who is Jenny, the girl uh, in Emmett's basement. So Ben Packard has a uh, personal connection to, uh, uh, to the missing girl and is very motivated to, to find out what happened to her uh, as the clock is ticking down. Um, I think the unique spin that I bring to uh, my book is that uh, Ben Packard is gay. He's a gay man uh, working in law enforcement in a rural small town community. Uh, I'm definitely not the first author to write in this space. Um, Joseph Hansen was doing this in the 70s. Uh, Ellen Hart, my fellow Minnesotan, has been writing her uh, Jane Lawless series for the last 30 years. Um, but I don't know, I just, when in my research, I didn't find a lot of uh, series or books that uh, kind of had the same uh, character uh, in this setting uh, as a gay man. And so uh, I would love to hear from you all if you have other uh, examples or books or series. Uh, I, I would love to hear about them. Um, I just couldn't find a lot in, in my research. Um, but it's a it's a thriller first and foremost. I wouldn't call it a gay thriller. I don't even know if that's a thing or or what that an example of what that would be. It, it's definitely a thriller first and foremost. I think if you are uh, a fan of John Sanford or William Kent Kruger, who are also great crime writers from Minnesota, who are huge influences on me, I think readers of those authors would like. Uh, and there he kept her. Um, Julie Clark read my book uh, early in the publication process and gave me a very generous blurb that uh, said fans of Sue Grafton would like uh, and there he kept her. So I think there's a lot of uh, crossover there with um, with uh, fans of, of those types of books. 
Um, I think just in summary, I, I just want to say that uh, it's this is like a kind of a full circle moment for me to to be sitting here talking about my debut novel with librarians and, and booksellers. Um, I was uh, an army brat growing up. So from a very young age, you know, pretty much every three years, we left everything behind our house, our school, our friends, and had to start over uh, wherever the army sent us. And the library was the constant wherever we went. There was always a library. There were always books. Um, my dad, we spent our summers with our dad in South Dakota. We're in a very small town where one of the original Carnegie libraries was built in the 1950s. That place still looms large in my in my memory. And uh, as long as I've had money, I've spent it on books. And we have so many great booksellers here in the Twin Cities. And uh, I'm really uh, excited uh, and, and thankful to uh, have the opportunity to sit here and, and tell you guys about my book. And uh, I wanna thank you for what you do. And thank you for having me. And uh, I hope you like the book. Cheers. Okay, thank you, Joshua. Um, our next author will have you being ready to unleash your own inner Scottish baker. Cunyach MacLeod was born and raised on the Isle of Lewis, the most northerly of the Outer Hebrides of Scotland, inspired by tr traditional family recipes and homegrown produce. Cunyach rose to fame as the Hebridean baker on TikTok in 2020. He was, has uh, motivated his worldwide followers to bake, forage, learn Gaelic, enjoy a dram or two of whiskey, and to seek a more wholesome, simple life. Along with his partner, Peter, and their Westie pup, Shaurus, Cunyuk's aim is to bring the best of the Scottish islands to a worldwide audience. Now, folks, this is sort of a cookbook plus. It's a cookbook, yes, but it's so much more. So, Cunyuk, take it away. Thank you so much, Todd, and Falcha, everybody. Uh, I'm here in the head, Outer Hebrides is now calling you. It's a wee bit cold, hence keeping warm with my hat and jumper, but it's a great pleasure to be with you. Uh, so Falcha, I'm Kanyoch. I'm the author of the Hebridean Baker Recipes and Wee Stories from the Scottish Islands. And I mean, I grew up on an island which is closer to the south coast of Iceland than it is to the south coast of England, hence being called the Hebridean Viking <laughs> by many people here. Um, but my mother was a weaver of Harris Tweed and my father was a North Atlantic fisherman. And I spent my youth watching my mother and aunts bake traditional family recipes. And it's this that has inspired me to launch the Hebridean Baker. Um, over the past 18 months, nearly 16 million people have watched my videos online. And as Todd said, I continue to try and motivate my followers, 70% um, of which are in the US. Uh, and I've tried to make them try new recipes and flavors, uh, hear me singing traditional Gaelic songs, hike in the mountains, and I really want them to dream of visiting the Scottish islands. And now I'm sharing what I would call the Hebridean Huga lifestyle. I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna show you some of the book uh, at the same time, if that's okay, everybody. Um, because it's, you know, for me, it's a very visual book. As, as Todd said, there's a lot more than just uh, recipes in here. Um, but this is my debut cookbook. And it's, it focuses on small bakes that use a simple set of ingredients. And I, as I, I really want to unleash a baker in, in the most humble, humble way. I'm not going to make people into a Michelin star chef, but I'm going to make you into the best home baker in your state, I promise. <laughs> For me, it's all about rustic home baking, classic recipes with a Scottish twist, and old family favorites, because I often say homemade is always best. Um, the book was released in Scotland in September 2021. So what's that, maybe four or five months ago. And it was the best selling cookbook by a Scottish author last year, which is a humbling experience. And I've been very fortunate to have had TV appearances on the BBC, ITV, Channel 4, 
and as well as being actually on the CBS uh, Sunday Breakfast Show quite recently as well. Um, there is one quote that I want to tell you. Um, I was featured in the US Elle magazine and uh, I just want to read a part of the quote. They said, um, the Hebridean baker has a scruffy Paul Bunyan beard. I don't think it's that scruffy, but anyway, um, <laughs> a knack for kneading and that ASMR voice that sounds how I imagine a warm shortbread cookie might talk if it came to life. <laughs> Come for his delicious carrot loaf recipe Stay for the way he says, cream your butter. <laughs> so that's the way I was introduced to many uh, of my American uh, audience. Um, but this is more than just a cookbook. It features really stunning photography. To be fair, lots of pics of me in a kilt <laughs> um, and a generous sprinkling of lots of stories of island life and culture from myths and legends to Gaelic songs, and even the true story of the day my father gave the Queen crabs. <laughs> I won't spoil the rest of that story for you now. Um, but the Hebridean Baker book offers a true taste of the Edger Hebrides. And I really want your, your book buyers to be delighted, both old and new. Um, for anyone who loves Scotland, I really feel that the Hebridean Baker book will be a real treat. It's packed with 75 recipes, including my 93-year-old Aunt Bellock's Clutie Dumpling, with, finally, after making it for 80 years, her secret ingredient. <laughs> I've got a whole chapter dedicated to oats from Cranachan, Bridesbone, and a Scots Flummery to more modern recipes as well, like whiskey ice cream, hot toddy shoe buns, and I promise you the best Christmas cake recipe in the world. And along with my partner, Patrick, is Shoris, our faithful West Highland Terrier, who is by our side as we travel through the islands, showcasing their beautiful scenery and landscapes. Now, who would be the customer for my book? Because I know there's, I know you're thinking, oh, I've got lots of cookbooks in my store or in my library. Well, I really hope there'll be many. Um, firstly, my, my existing follower base who are in the US who haven't been able to buy the book before. It's released on the 3rd of May. Uh, on social media, I have about a quarter of a million followers in, in the US. Um, but then there's those with a Scottish heritage who, who just want a taste of the old country, or maybe fans of Outlander who maybe want the real life Jamie Fraser to bake them a cake, um, or simply passionate home bakers who want to try new recipes. I live by the old Gaelic saying, Berry Bavas Er Lois. It means there's a time for everything. And I really want my book to inspire the readers to do three things. Slow down and enjoy life's simple pleasures. Try some of my recipes and come and visit the Outer Hebrides. And I'd love it if you all do the same thing as well. If you'd like to share in my adventures, uh, you can follow me on TikTok and Instagram at Hebridean Baker. And I know there's a Q&A uh, right now, so please ask questions. But if you don't get the chance, get in touch. My email is hebrideanbaker at gmail.com. Uh, a wee bit of exciting news. I'm traveling to the US to do a two-week countrywide media and book tour in May to coincide with the release of the book. Um, I've loved hosting events and book signings in many indie stores across Scotland, and I would love to do the same in America. So if you are going to sell my book, please let us know. I'd love to visit your town to do a book signing or, a, or an event as well. Um, and finally for me, which is really exciting, um, is if you have or will enjoy my first debut cookbook, I'm excited to let you know that my second named The Hebridean Baker, My Island Kitchen, will be released later this year. So thank you so much and uh, look forward to seeing you all when I visit the US.
Thanks, Todd. Okay, thank you, Cognac. That was lovely. Uh, we're going back over to the fiction side next, um, and we're going to hear from Iman Hariri Kia. Uh, and Iman is a writer and editor born in New York City, um, a nationally acclaimed journalist. She covers sex, relationships, identity, and adolescence. And you can find her, you can often find her writing about her personal life on the internet, much to her parents' dismay. Iman uh, is the author of 100 Other Girls, and I'll give the stage to you. Well, thank you so much. A big thank you to Sourcebooks and to Dominique for inviting me. Um, I'm going to be honest, I've got crazy imposter syndrome with all these literary giants in this call, but I'm going to try to give you a quick intro into me, despite, you know, any tension I create with my parents writing about my personal life online and invite you inside the world of 100 other girls. So my name's Iman. I'm a writer, editor, and author from New York City. I'm so excited to invite you into this world of my beautiful cover, 100 Other Girls, which basically asks the question to readers, how far would you go to keep the job that 100 other girls are ready to take? So my debut novel follows Nora, a young Middle Eastern woman who has recently graduated college and is tutoring rich Upper East Side kids while crashing on her sister's couch when she gets the opportunity of a lifetime, a chance to work for her favorite culture magazine, Vinyl. Now, the pages of Vinyl raised Nora, basically teaching her everything from how to insert a tampon to who to vote for. But once she arrives, she quickly learns that all is not as it appears. The print and digital teams are in a full-blown turf war with each other and chaos ensues. With her dream job on the line and both teams pressuring Nora, she'll have to pick a side or form her own. Exploring themes like the decline of the publishing industry, the rise of digital media, identity exploitation, a spicy workplace romance, sisterhood, and more, 100 Other Girls is a true coming-of-age story for women in their 20s. I like to think of it as the Devil Wears Prada meets the bold type. So I grew up, like most second generation children, with a foot in two different worlds. It's not Western enough to be considered fully American, but I also wasn't Middle Eastern enough to be considered fully Iranian. Unable to speak candidly with my parents about these experiences, I sought solace between the glossy pages of Big Sister magazines. These publications basically dragged me out of my isolation and gave me a sense of belonging. So I resolved to one day become a writer and to give back to a community that gave so much to me. But decades later, after a lot of hard work, I was lucky enough to land a coveted position at one of the very magazines that I idolized, the assistant to the editor-in-chief of Teen Vogue, only to watch in disbelief as the company fell apart before my very eyes, the print edition unexpectedly shuttered and folded, and the entire staff got laid off in one brutal blow. As industry veterans and tastemakers packed up their desks and wiped away tears, I was only left with one question. What the hell happened? The concept for 100 Other Girls was born later that day. My story centers a heated conflict between a fictional vinyl magazine's outdated elitist print team and a sprightly woke, but for the wrong reasons, digital team. And then Nora, the young aspiring writer who gets caught in the middle. She loves the brand, but she grows disillusioned with the ways that the print team discredits and the digital team exploits her Middle Eastern identity. But at the end of the day, both teams and Nora fall prey to a larger broken system that can't be fixed. The only solution to stay and fight for change or to remove herself altogether. There's always been this global fascination with the glamorous world of New York media, but I realized that there actually hadn't been a truthful depiction of the industry since the Devil Wears Prada, which way predated the digital media boom. As someone who has worked at every level of the industry, from intern to top editor, I wanted to draw a picture of publications struggling to survive, of departments fighting each other for resources, of generational editors taking swings in the dark to remain relevant. I also painted the world of 100 Other Girls and the vibrant shades through which I've experienced the industry and further New York City, full of rich diversity. There are characters of all races, genders, sexualities, abilities, 
cultures, classes, and more, but their plot lines do not center, nor do they exploit those identities. As Nora navigates clickbait, content mills, cancel culture, the difference between tokenization and true representation, the reader will too. Fun, as I like to say, surprisingly insightful and full of heart, 100 Other Girls really is an ode to a forever evolving industry, but more importantly, the storytellers within those industries whose words will resonate way past their employment. This book is so personal to me, not just as a writer, but also as a reader. I've been obsessed with realistic fiction and young and new adult novels for as long as I can remember. In fact, my eyesight is so bad, you might have noticed, <laughs> because when my mom forced me to go to bed as a kid, I'd read in the dark for so long that I eventually needed glasses. I spent years writing fan mail to authors like Meg Cabot and Lisey Harrison to no avail. Used to get kicked out of my library by Miss Crow, the librarian. Miss Crow, if you're watching this, I'm sorry. And I beg for gift cards to indies like McNally Jackson and The Strand every year for my birthday and spent my entire allowance on new books. So believe me, it's truly an honor to be able to speak with you all about my own novel today. Big thank you to the booksellers and to the librarians and to the book talkers and the book influencers for all that you do to inspire and enrich the worlds of young women like me. This is obviously so surreal and I am so grateful to Source Books for the opportunity to talk to you. I hope that you all take a chance on 100 Other Girls, another look at the beautiful cover, and fall in love with these characters in the world as much as I have. Um, I feel like there's so much more to say. So if you want to chat further, you can connect with me on Instagram. You can connect with me on TikTok. You can DM me. You can text me. You can email me, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And thank you so, so much. Thank you, Iman. This is, uh, folks, this is a really wonderful debut. Uh, uh, right, we urge you to dig in. Um, uh, so wrapping up for us today will be Julie Clark. Um, uh, Julie Clark is the New York Times bestselling author of The Ones We Choose and The Last Flight, which was also a number one international bestseller and has been translated into more than 20 languages. Indie booksellers, you may have gotten to meet Julie at Winter, Winter Institute in Baltimore just before the pandemic and to, to all of you who met her there and supported the last flight following that and, and, and helped to push that onto the New York Times bestsellers list, we thank you. Uh, Julie lives in Los Angeles with her family and a golden doodle with poor impulse control. Julie's here to tell us about her upcoming suspense novel, The Lies I Tell. And as someone who loved The Last Flight, I'm here to tell you that Julie Clark does it again. But I'll let Julie tell you about that now. Thank you. Um, I'm just so happy to be here. I, you know, talking to booksellers, talking to librarians is just such a privilege. So thank you so much for having me here. Um, I'm going to tell you right up front, this is the first time that I have pitched The Lies I Tell. I, I could do Last Flight in my sleep, um, but The Lies I Tell is, oh no, there we go. The Lies I Tell is um, my next book. It's a thriller, uh, I think it's, or domestic suspense. I, I, I get fuzzy on the categories because I just like to write books. So Lies I Tell is a story of two women, Meg, a con artist, and Kat, the investigative reporter who's been after her for 10 years. Um, the story is opens where Meg has returned to Los Angeles after a long absence of being vanished and Kat sees her and realizes like the time is now, I'm, I'm gonna get her. And as the two women kind of infiltrate each other's lives, Kat posing as somebody she's not in a way that Meg is also posing as someone she's not, it kind of becomes unclear who is conning whom. Um, I got the idea from a podcast actually that I listened to several years ago. I think I talked about it first with my source book friends um, in the cab in Baltimore and Winter Institute, you know, Margaret was there and Valerie was there, Michael was there. And um, I said, I think I'm gonna write a book about a con artist next, a female con artist. And they were like, oh, ooh, you know, and anytime you get that kind of reaction, you know that you're, you, need to, you need to pursue it. And so I did a ton of research into con artists. Um, one of the things I wondered was, you know, could, could, could women be con artists too? The one that I was listening to was about a man, a, a male con artist. And I thought, you know, I think women would be better at it. 
You know, I think women would be much better con artists because we are, I think, you know, people are more inclined to trust us in ways that maybe they wouldn't a man. And so I kind of started diving into research on con artists and read a ton of books about female con artists. And there's a big spectrum. There are the, there are the fortune tellers on the corner in New York city. And then there are the mega, mega sociopaths that like steal, steal fortunes and Ponzi schemes. And, and uh, I wanted to create a character who sort of fell in the middle. And like all my books, I feel really strongly that how I portray women on the page matters in this world where women have to fight for our voices to be heard and trusted and believed. Um, I want to make sure that I am portraying reliable, smart, savvy women on the page because I think that that's important in this world today. So, um, you know, the lies I tell isn't just a story about a con artist, you know? I mean, it would have been really fun to have Meg just creating havoc across page after page, but, you know, I am always asking myself, why would a character do this? What, what's her motivation? And this is sort of where, like I said earlier, I, I guess it's a thriller, I don't really know, um, because I sort of feel like my books fall into several lanes. You know, yeah, I write suspense, and there's high stakes, and there's, you know, all of the things that you expect in a thriller or a suspense book. But I also think that I have an element of women's fiction in my stories as well, because there's this emotional third rail that I feel is so important to hold a reader's attention. I want my characters to learn and grow and be different, maybe not better, but different at the end of their story than they were at the beginning. And I don't know that you find that a lot in you know traditional thrillers that are high octane and lots of action. And so I'm always thinking about, you know, what is it, what is it that's making this character tick? What is it that's making this character do what they want to do? And I needed to do that for both of my main characters, Kat, Kat the investigative reporter, and Meg, my con artist. And, um, you know, I also think that it falls into, you know, the literary category where, you know, it's deep character study. You know, you really do get immersed in these characters' lives and who they are and what they want and their pasts in addition to the forward action of, of the main plot that I'm hoping will carry forward. Um, you know, I, I write for readers that want smart characters. I write for readers that want to root for people who maybe aren't always making the best choices. And I think that, you know, this is a book about empowerment. You know, it's a book about taking back what was stolen. It's a book about justice and revenge. Meg has a line in the book that says the only difference between justice and revenge is who's telling the story. And, um, and for Meg, that's absolutely true. Is she out for justice? Is she out for revenge? Same question could be asked for Kat as well. Um, I write about women who have agency, women who can recognize the mistakes that they've made. They know that maybe where, how they got where they are was misguided. And, you know, they own that. There's not, there's not, vic there aren't any victims in my story. There aren't people that, you know, wring their hands and say, how did I get here? You know, I think my characters are, are important because they, they teach us all how to sort of face the choices that we've made, the ways that we've dealt with our own trauma and, um, and, and shown us that, you know, you can, you can say, yeah, I did that. And that there's always a better path forward. And, you know, I'm always trying to create like that me too moment for my reader. And, you know, maybe my readers of this book aren't going to be like, yeah, I'm a con artist too. You know, that's not exactly what I'm going for, but I am going for that. Yeah. I felt that way. Or yeah, I've known somebody that, that had those feelings. Yeah. I've been able to struggle with something and, you know, come out on top or maybe I didn't, um, you know, and so, and so the lies I tell is really a book about second chances Yes, it's a book about revenge. I have Meg doing all kinds of things that were really, really fun to write. I watched Ocean's Eleven many times. Um, there is no official soundtrack to Ocean's Eleven, by the way, I've looked because I thought that would be really great music to write to. Um, but what I did end up doing was I ended up creating a playlist of songs that are all cover songs for the book because I felt like, um, you know, what better, what better music to write to than um, than, than songs that are pretending to be something that they're not, which is original, like Meg. Um, so The Lies I Tell is coming out in June, 
And again, like booksellers, librarians, I just can't, you know, I cannot say enough about the important work that you do for me as a writer, but me as a mother, you know, libraries were the place where I used to take my kids when they were really, really little. I'm a single mom. It's, you know, weekends are long when you're a single mom. And, you know, I was able to take my kids. They could, you know, it was a place where we were welcomed. It was free. Same thing with bookstores. You know, it was the place that my grandfather used to take me and it was guaranteed I'd walk out with at least one book because his policy, which has become my policy, is anytime my kids want a book, anytime they want to go to a bookstore, we go to a bookstore. We go right away and it's whatever they want, we're going to get. And we spend hours in there. And so just, you know, bookstores and libraries are sort of my, my magic place, my special place. And so I wanted to say, Thank you for all of the work that you did to hand sell the last flight, all of the work that you do to support all of the authors everywhere. I just, I can't thank you enough. Um, I have one plug for our pre-orders. We have a pre-order campaign where I have written the bonus chapter for the last flight, which is the alternate ending. Now I can't say any more than that for people who haven't yet read the last flight, but I get a lot of messages from readers about um, the ending of the last flight and why I made that choice. And I stand by that choice, but I will say that it got me thinking and talking with the folks at Sourcebooks about, you know, could I, could I, could I write the alternate ending? Could I have done that? And I did. And it was maybe the most fun I've had writing in a very long time. It was a pleasure to revisit the world of Eva and Claire and Dex and, and Rory and all of those characters who, who live inside of me and live inside of so many readers. I've been fortunate enough to sell, sell um, over 500,000 copies of The Last Flight worldwide. Um, so I just can't wait to bring you the bonus chapter of The Last Flight, which will be available for any pre-orders for participating indie bookstores. So um, please do that because I can't wait to get that into readers' hands. So thank you so much. Thanks so much for having me, all of you. Thank you, Julie. Um, oh my God, the, the the ending of the last flight. What a what a, what a what a what a treat to be able to to see it in another in another way. Um, so uh, thank you, Julie. Thank you to um, to all of our authors and to a uh, big thank you to everyone who's taken time out of your day to join us this, this afternoon. We are obviously all incredibly excited about these authors and their upcoming books, and we're thrilled that we had the opportunity to share them with you. Um, I promised I'd say this again, that uh, now you just need to go make sure to, to go to Edelweiss or NatGalley to download, read, and fall in love with them the way that we have here at Sourcebooks. And I thank Thank you, everyone, and I wish you a wonderful rest of your afternoon. Thank you, everybody. It was so great 